Along with being the proprietor of 21, one of the world's most renowned restaurants, Peter Krindler is probably more responsible for promoting an appreciation of the artist Frederick Remington than any other American. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein with restaurateur, philanthropist, sportsman, and art collector, Peter Krindler. How do you resolve your fascination with the West with your life as an urban restaurateur? As I've often said, I think it's psychological. Having been born on the streets of New York, which are called the concrete of New York, I sort of always had a desire for the mountains, the lakes, the green grasses, and I eventually found my way out to Wyoming, where fortunately for me, I became a director of the, a member of the board of directors of the Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody, Wyoming. Frederick Remington was a documentary artist who dedicated his life to depicting the life of the West. What about his work particularly affects you? Well, I would say his portrayal of the outdoors, particularly the horse, his uh, ability to put on canvas the activity of, the, of this great animal. The, his ability to put on canvas the, some of the background scenery that he portrays so well. Well, everything about Frederick Remington made him, I think, the great artist of the West. Your office is filled with the memorabilia of a very long and fulfilling career, including some Remington uh, pictures. What are the two that are in your office? One is called, may I look around? Please yeah. The one right behind me is called let me, How Deep Part. It's a greeting by a man coming up on horseback to some of the people in the in front of the log cabin. And the one up on the wall to my left is called How The Vision or How Message Number Six Got Through, which is a very important painting by Mr. Remington. Um, it shows his ability first to portray a horse when it's almost given up. This, uh, the the uh, half-breed who's riding the horse has been looking to deliver this important message. Our message number six got through is, it, is one of the titles. And the horse is about ready to collapse when suddenly he sees this vision of this beautiful Indian girl. And Frederick Rowton has often used this girl in, in many other of his paintings. Always this girl because he rarely depicted women in his yeah. paintings? That's a very, very rare. His great ability was to depict the horse and the Indian. And as a combination, I don't think there's anybody who could beat him. Frederick Remington also was an Eastern. He came out of New York State. Canton, New York. Canton, New York. They realized almost the ice belt of New York. Went to Yale for a couple of years and got sort of fed up with the East. Maybe he had the same, what do you call it, neurosis or the, uh, or the, concrete, the concrete of his little town in comparison with New York, and off he went. He's a pretty good boxer, and he really had to fight his way more than once in one of those rough Western saloons of, of that time. And he became a very successful man. He came back East to fell in love with this lovely girl up in Canton, whom he married, eventually took her out west, and eventually did all his great, his great art, his great works. He almost, he almost went back to his father's business. His father was a newspaper publisher. And he almost, he almost went back into the newspaper business, but he had enough, well, that's what makes people great, be it in the art world, particularly in the art world. They have this great zest for wanting to do what they think they have the ability to do. During the course of your lifetime, you've noticed a great change in the interest in American art. There was a time that American art was considered neither aesthetically or monetarily valuable. How do you explain this great change? Well, I think I participated in this great change to some extent. Because I, in my lifetime, I've known some, some of the great art collectors and I remember getting involved in a very deep argument, and I'd say one of the greatest of them. And who was that? Well, I think it was, well, not I think, I know it was Chester Dale, who I think, in my 
humble opinion, for my lifetime, was the greatest art collector we've had. He gave the National Gallery, of which he was chairman of the board then and for many years, I think 283 pictures. And the reason why I say 283, because the last 83, over a period of about 10 or 15 years, I looked at him almost once a month in his apartment at the plaza. And Chester Dale, I never called him Chester, he was much older than I was. He wouldn't like to be called Mr. Dale because he wanted to be as young as I was. So we sort of wheeled and dealed, and I called him Chester Dale. And I got home, I said, Chester, for gosh sakes, why can't, why isn't there any American art in your collection? He gave me some good reasons, you know, about uh, how easy it is for an American artist. We had WPA projects, if you remember. No, you wouldn't remember you much, do you? But in the 30s, like, you, know, you take Ben Sean, take you take him, take Sawyer, the three brothers, or whoever they were. They always had a place to eat. And Dale always thought an artist had to suffer and really push like a son of a gun. Was there anyone who especially influenced you in terms of your interest in the work of Remington? Tell us about Harold McCracken. Well, I've known Harold now, must be better than 40 years. He influenced me, if anybody started, he and my brother, because he influenced my brother, Jack, who started the art collection in the late 20s and the early 30s, when he knew Harold. Harold used to live in Douglaston, Long Island. He'd come in in New York, and he'd always come in here, and they got to be friendly. Then I got to be friendly. And then the outgrowth was, buy all the pictures you can. Well, we had a man come in here who owed us a bill. It wasn't that big. Who brought in a picture just to settle his bill. That picture today must be worth at least 50,000 bucks. And his bill was not near. His bill was only in three figures. How much of your time is connected to the Cody Museum? It may be located in Wyoming, but you often say that it has national significance. It has now. We've built that up into the finest Western museum that exists in America today. Western meaning cowboy, Indian. It has, we have just been given the finest gun collection in the world by the Olin Winchester people. We have Plains Indians costumes, artifacts, jewelry, the likes of which no other museum in America has. We have, as I say, we're the only museum maybe in the whole world that has a very, very, maybe the finest, not maybe, the finest collection of Buffalo Bill memorabilia. Will we ever have a chance to see the treasures of the Cody Museum here in the East? Well, I think there'll be a good chance. I've just spoken to Mr. Botwinick and Mr. Lane. Mr. Botwinick is the uh, director of the Brooklyn Museum. And we're arranging, I hope it works out, to have a show at the Brooklyn Museum in 79 into 1980. I know from looking at your belt and listening to your talk that you are indeed a cowboy. And now that I look over your shoulder, I see an Indian artifact. Are you an Indian too? Well, that was presented to me by the Shoshone Indian tribe. Oh, years ago, oh, I'd say 10, they adopted me as a Shoshone Indian tribe. Let me uh, show it to you. Ah! These are eagle claws. It's against the law for any white man to kill, hunt down an eagle. But the Indian at that time had the right to be able to do that. This is one of the few things that the white man has left the Indian to do, like he's allowed to fish. On the West Coast, for instance, he has fishing rights to all the salmon rivers. So the Indians presented me with this. It's really a magnificent. Why did they choose to present you with that? Well, they felt I had done so much for the town of Cody, so much for the Indians in the area. 
right now we just broken ground in Cody for an Indian building. We're going to put up a building that will cost us three and a half million dollars, known as the Plains Indians Building. Again, it's the Indians of that area, Montana, Wyoming, the Dakotas, Colorado, Utah, who am I admitting? I don't want any state to be insulted. Are there many other Jewish Indians? I'm the only one in America. I take, and I take a lot of pride in it. Do you have an Indian name? I think they gave me one, but I think I had too much fire water. <laughs> I don't find that. Art has many forms, and obviously there are those among us who think that fine cuisine is an applied Is it an art form? Certainly. How did 21 become 21? Well, right now it's 21 because it's a dress. It's known as 21 Club. The address is 21 West 52nd Street. And in 1929, in January, we, we moved from 42 West 49th Street, which has become part of Rockefeller Center. But we had this 30-day clause in our lease, so upon 30 days notice, we had to get out. We found this building, and we then made up our mind that we were going to buy the building and never lease or rent. That's why we're still here. Well, there are a few places that are considered more a New York institution than 21. Is 21 a very exclusive place? Can anyone come here? Mm, we call it exclusive, but anyone can come here. And why do you call it a club? That's a name that's been uh, sort of adopted by the people who come here, the 21 Club. It's easy to say. People seem to enjoy saying it. A lot of people come here feel they're coming to their club. That's how comfortable we make them feel. A lot of businessmen, and women too, have spent their life getting into the eating class. Is lunch here lunch, or is it business? I would say it's a happy combination of both. You, you brought up a very uh, important subject right at the moment, because the federal government is looking to restrict the supposed as President Carter called it the three martini lunch. I don't think the president realizes that the three martini lunch is going by the way of the boards quite a number of years ago. What replaced it? One glass of white wine? Maybe a glass of white wine. People are too absorbed. The competition to be in business is too tough. They know that they have to be able to talk properly to whoever they're doing business with. There's a lot more freedom. I imagine over a luncheon or over a dinner table than there would be in an office. Walking into an office almost scares you because you have to worry about the man at the other end of the hall or sitting behind that desk. And I think uh, it's much easier, at least I found it so, when I want to do business. Does it really matter where you sit at 21? Is it better to sit upstairs or downstairs? I, uh, when I have dinner here, you know, and I, my, I always sit upstairs. I like it upstairs. It's a little quieter, a little bit more room. You know, we're on the most expensive rental street in the world, and if you give too much room, you can't afford it. There are some internationally known businessmen, that some of whom have eaten, used to eat here every day of their lives, practically. Well, some still do. The, other, the only reason the others don't, I think they've gone to their maker. We have people, there's one chap, there's one, two, I know, at least a half a dozen. But one man has been coming here for 50 years every day. The only time we hear from him is when he doesn't come in. He'll call us and say, I won't be in for a week. Does he change the menu? The same menu every day is handed to that man. Every day he'll eat something different. But looking at actually the same menu every day as he goes along. So Nassus a frequent uh, diner here, Aristotle Onassis. Oh, when he, yes, God rest his soul. He was a very nice guy. I felt sorry for him. He was a really remarkable fellow when you, when you think of his background and everything else. Don't forget, he didn't do it in America. He did it throughout the world. And we say only America's a land of opportunity. He's a guy who says the world is a place of opportunity. Does a man like Onassis sit in the same table every day? He sat there. Every, every time he was in New York, he sat at the same place and always have people around him, business people. This guy never just ate. Oh, no way. He ate and talked, talked and ate. Any special menu for him? 
every day ate the same thing. No, anybody could have gotten ate a minute steak, had a drink of uh, Russian vodka. Then with his minute steak, he'd have purple onions thinly sliced and kosher dill pickles at every day. There must be some secret to that diet. Well, somebody, I was in Detroit once when the book The Fabulous Greeks was written, if I may tell the story. And uh, I was hosting, I was a master of ceremonies by request at the Detroit, Athl Detroit Athletic Club. They had two nights, Friday and Saturday night, and they had asked me, Eddie Cole, and also, God rest his soul, was then a president of General Motors and president of Detroit AC. I said, Pete, you've got to come out here. You've got to be the master of ceremonies because we're, we're planning 221 nights. We want to borrow tablecloth napkins, all the rest of it, and we want you to bring a chef out. I said, Eddie, I'm not any master of ceremonies. I'm, I'm a restaurateur. He says, you got to come. Well, we did. And after I made my speech and welcomed all the rest of it, I sat down with a group of what I call the young grandmas and their husbands. As I said, around that time, the book, The Fabulous Greeks, had been written by Doris Lilly. And one of the women says, Pete, is Aristotle Onassis come in? I said, every day that he's in New York. But what does he eat? Well, the other one. And I told him, as I just told you. But one of the women says, what do you think it does for sex life with Jackie? I said, I wouldn't know that. Anyway, it was all kidding and a lot of fun. So I got home. And I said to myself, what do I send these women? So I sent each one of them a bag of purple onions and a jar of kosher pickles. I said, hope these do you some good. Within a week, I got an answer. Send more pickles. Everything is great. So you see, there's, even with Mr. Onassis, there's a, he was quite a man. Hell of a guy. And I've often said, there isn't anybody who is anybody that doesn't come through 21. You've been at 21 for more than 40 years now, when a, an American literary tradition flourished. It's been a haven for writers and statesmen and politicians, too. And you, uh, I know, have had uh, personal relationships with a number of them. Can you tell us about some of them? Well, I'll pick uh, at least two of our Nobel Prize winners, Hemingway and Steinbeck. With Hemingway, I was fortunate enough to fish once down in Cuba, meeting him at the uh, very famous El Florida. It was a saloon. And Hemingway was quite a habitué of that place. And anybody who was anybody would, would go there because it made the best frozen daiquiri in all of Cuba. And that's where you met everybody. So when I arrived, boom. First place you went to was there. First man, no, not that, not that Mr. Hemingway would be the first man, but there, he'd be there with some other Cuban friends of mine that I knew we'd go fishing or we'd go down to Camingway, bird shooting. But I had the good fortune, as I said, to fish with Hemingway. And he was, he was a great fisherman, very odd. That's what I liked about him, full of beans, whatever he did. Well, his books prove it. Was Steinbeck a fisherman too? No. He was a drinking friend. No. Well, Steinbeck and I would have a drink at the bar, not at the bar, at the table. And I told Steinbeck how, how great his book, particularly Travels with Charlie, was. I loved it. Before I bought it, I thought Charlie was a friend of his, a male friend, you know. I find out it's his dog. And it, was, it was one of the, I think, more so than any of his other books. That's why, let's see, I think that was one of the reasons he got the Nobel Award. I suppose they combined all of them. Then I went back and read everything he'd written. He was a great writer. And a great, he wrote for a cause, but John Steinbeck just didn't write willy-nilly. And what was that cause, as you see? Well, poor people, their right to live, like he came from 
Pacific Coast, the, uh, oh, the Great Barrier, what's the name of that? Fresno, in that whole area, about the Armenians and the, the foreign element that lived there for a long time were in that business. I visited out there, so I know a little bit about it. But you understand that? And then there was another great author, was what's his name, who wrote a lot about Africa. He also wrote for Field and Stream, that's how I got to know him. Audrey? How? Audrey? Robert Audrey? He's gone. He, the fellow I'm talking about is dead. Bob Ruach. Oh, Robert Ruach. Robert Ruach. Met him in Africa. I, I'd go and over four or five times, and each time I went, I'd see Dr. Schweitzer first, then we'd go down to South Africa and visit with some friends of mine, and then go up to Kenya. But Robert Ruach was had a lot of talent, and same with uh, John O'Hara. Yeah, a lot of talent. Are there contemporary writers who come here? Now? Oh, I imagine so, sure. I, I don't think he's a contemporary writer who doesn't. I'd rather put it on that foot. Oh. With your interest in art, it always seems interesting to me that not as many artists come as writers. How do you explain that? I was going to say, <laughs> almost a cliche, maybe they can't afford it. Lots of famous restaurants in this world. What makes 21 unique? Just 21. Everything that makes 21. It's attention to, the most important thing is, it's attention to the customer. That we, management, insists that every employee, we have almost 300 of them in this restaurant, gives to the customer. And you see, I'm maybe showing my restlessness and the fact that I'm not working. People expect me to be there, and you get there. No, but it's got a... You, you, you go from table to table? Oh, say hello to everybody and how you're doing, and if I know enough about them. How's business, how's the family? There's very little... I shouldn't say that you don't know, but there's a very fine, at least for me, in management, the management team, a real camaraderie amongst the customer and the management. And it goes up to a certain point and then it stops because you, you can't sit there. A customer don't come to sit down and be entertained by Pete Krinder. If he's there with somebody, he's doing business. I say hello and sort of move off. What about your work do you like most? Everything about it. Oh, I love to get in, I get in quite early because then I like to write longhand letters. I never dictate a letter. Every letter I write is longhand. Are you a big correspondent? Oh, I love to write letters. I write at least 20 a day. I'll see something in a newspaper like, I want to write Juanita Crap. She's a secretary of college. She's doing a hell of a job, I think. I know her quite well. And I'll write her. I, I don't take the liberty now of writing a Dear Juanita. And I'll say, Dear Madam Secretary, congratulations, or something that I want to say in my way. I don't have any set way of writing. I'm a very, it's got to be what I want to, what I think. And I can't, not that I can't dictate, but I like to write. I have a good hand, too. You were trained as yeah. a lawyer. How does a man who studied the law end up running a saloon, a restaurant? How did that all happen? I think it's family business. My father had a saloon before me. When did that start? Oh, before the First War, about 19, 14, 13, 12, 10. On the Lower East Side? When I became of age, I was a little bar boy. When I say became of age, I was able to walk around. You had to, had to get in there and do some work. So I washed glasses and things like that in the saloon. Okay. Then an uncle had a saloon also in that area. So it becomes part of it. How did a saloon from the Lower East Side wind its way to the Upper West Side? That's a good question. My brother Jack. The one who died in 1947. He was a guy that inspired 21. Meaning what was to become 21 in 1920.
22, 23, when he bought a little place, he and Charlie Burns, that's why it was known, that's why that partnership, Crindler Burns, still exists to this day. I and Jerry Burns are associated here. And the foundation is known as the Crindler Burns Fund. That's what started. They bought a place in Greenwich Village then, in 1922. Yeah, I was just graduating from high school. It was called the Redhead, a very, what we would call jivey place today, but in those days. What was the dance? The Cushman? Well, this goes back many, many, well, it goes back a lot of years, half a century ago. This is where Greenwich Village was. We used to live down there. I think four in one room. You see, a lot of that area uh, where Washington <coughs> Square is, it's all pretty much owned by New York University. In those days, it wasn't. In those days, they were private, magnificent homes. All those, uh, call it brownstones. It was a, quite an area. But things change, most of them for the better. Most of them. If there, you had it to do over again, what would you do otherwise? It's funny I was talking about that yesterday. I don't know. I don't know that I knew much else. Maybe I would have started in this business, business earlier, maybe. But I was here all my life. I don't know if I've been here 55 years, since the day it opened almost. Not as a steady employee, but I would come in, and maybe steal a drink, something like that. But I don't know that I'd want to do much else. I've had a lot of happiness here. And as I was telling Mr. Cook, our great photographer, if you're happy in what you're doing, brother, it's duck soup. It really, you're very lucky. Very few people on this earth reach that plateau where they're doing what they want. I know I've reached it a long time ago. What Frederick Remington has done for the Far West, truthfully and skillfully depicted, Peter Crindler has done for a slice of New York. Special thanks for letting us be with you at 21. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and thank you, audience, for being with us, too.